All right, welcome everybody to the second episode of our podcast, Destruction. And today we have two guests, Mason Jeller and Ben Slater, right? Yeah. <laughs> Who will be talking to us about the theory of fiction and what is that? Counterfact counterfactuals. Okay. Mason will first introduce us to the his concept of fiction, his theory of fiction. Okay. Well. There are various ways I can motivate this. Um, well, actually, I should say thank you so much, Max, for having me again on uh, your podcast, as I've said. Well, actually, this I will say, two of my most important intellectual interlocutors are, are here before me, Max <laughs> and Ben Slater. Um, I guess probably to each of you, I've spoken rather highly of the other. Now, okay. Well, one way to motivate this would be to ask, what's the difference between talking to someone who's just spewing or saying a whole bunch of things that are false and and reading a novel, most of whose sentences, if like really asserted by the author, would be false? Um, yeah. And what's your take? Well, I'm, I'm actually interested to hear what your actually first answer is. Oh, okay. Yeah. That's a good one. That's a very interesting one. Hey, you're reading this book. I see you have a fiction book on your desk. I, Robot. Yeah, I yeah. have one. Yeah. I, Robot. I, is like Asimov. Yeah. So... Imagine if there was... Yeah, imagine if someone was just saying these these things. Yeah. So, Powell broke into a power room. Well... That's, 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 that's well, that one you might want to... You might want to give some more where it sounds even crazier. But, um, okay, let me find something even crazier. And you might want to keep on doing it. And suppose someone were really telling you this. Bokert flattened his black hair down with both hands. That was the 34th RB model we have turned out, landing. All the others were strictly orthodox. The third man at the, the table frowned. Milton Ashes was the youngest officer of U.S. robots and mechanical men <laughs> and proud of his post. Okay, good, good, good. U.S. robots, okay. No, oh, I think you, you like this. If you can answer for an entire assembly line, I recommend your, your promotion. By exact count, there are 70, 70, 75,234 75, operations necessary for the manufacture of a single positronic, po positronic brain. Hmm. Yeah. No. So, for example, I, I can say a word. There are 75,254 operations for the manufacturing of a posit yeah. positronic brain. Now, what's the difference between, I guess, um, what's the difference between someone writing that and you're reading it and someone just on someone on the street just saying that and uh, you're hearing it I have to ask myself am I believing that is true okay this is a good this is a good place mm -hmm. to go this seems to be a good this seems to be a fruitful path of yeah thought yeah it's not true even to me not true even to you good good yeah. good good it not may be true, true. it may be true to Isaac Atimov to me you might believe that the author believes it. Mm -hmm. You might. I suspect that you don't, though. You probably don't. I think yeah. that you think he doesn't believe what he's saying. Yeah. Um, Not really. Yeah. Okay. Now. And the, the guy on the streets also believe that. Yeah. It's not true. Well, you think so? What happens if he was really... I mean, he, he can be lying. He, he could be, be lying. trying he could to be lie. lie. He could be lying. Yeah. That's a good... Even if he's lying, there is a difference between that and the author of a fiction book. Okay. Um... Now, and some people, of course, are, are earnestly saying things that really don't seem to be true. Yeah. If, if some guy drunk off the street came up to you and started telling you about the number of operations in a positronic brain, <laughs> you might think that he actually meant what he said. Yep. Which doesn't necessarily mean that it's true. Yep. Um, but, yeah, just to give it Yeah. Point. Yeah, I think Max, for instance, has, sincerely says many false things. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. Okay. Now, um, uh, now, 
Okay, now I'm going to give my theory, and which will come with an answer to this question I posed. Yeah. Isaac Asimov, or Asimov, whatever this guy, the author, Isaac Asimov, intends you to suppose that an utterance with the same words was produced by a cer by by someone with certain attitudes, um, which could be. Uh, I intend you to believe, or I intend you to hold true my sentence. I intend, I intend the sentence to mean so and so. This sort of thing. Um, I intend you to get that I'm being sarcastic. And this, this person, or this, this someone by whom the author intends you to imagine these words were produced, we call the narrator. Now, what's the difference between talking to a crazy person? And talking to, I also think not only does Isaac Asimov also intend you to suppose, but he intends you to get that he intends you to suppose. Um, this is an interesting feature. But um, so, what's the difference between talking to a crazy person and reading a novel? Well, well, Isaac Asimov, I think, isn't asserting things with these words. He's um, he's asking you to imagine that someone's asserting things with these words. The crazy person's just asserting things with these words. That's a simple way to put it. Now, a very harsh way to put my theory, and you, I think this might be a rather, um, yeah, this might, this might, this might be a way that is, is likely to meet with push, this might be a way of expressing my ideas that's likely to meet with pushback, though it is a rather harsh way of putting it, and I, I, I might like it. Fictional texts are meaningless, at least on the level of literal meaning. They have an intended imaginary meaning. They want you, the author wants you to imagine that someone uttered them such as to mean a certain thing. But the author doesn't himself mean certain things by these words. Now, um, that's my answer. This actually doesn't have to do with counterfactuals. We, we haven't, haven't gotten to do with counterfactuals. We what? haven't said anything about we have, them yet. Yeah. Now, now we can get into counterfactuals. I'm actually interested. Do, what, do, you, do you have anything on this? You like this idea? I, I like that. I like that. Okay. Go on. Okay, now let's talk about counterfactuals. Wait, wait. But what about the, the mad person? The mad person, I think, is just... The difference would be that he's using words to assert things or something like that. Um, whereas... And also, liars can assert things. As Liars can assert things. Um, he himself he, is asserting. Yeah. But the writer is intending that a narrator is asserting. Yes, yeah. And the writer wants you to imagine that the narrator is asserting. Right? And so... Interestingly, another way to another thing to say would be here would be that not writing a fictional novel, writing and writing and reading a novel are a form of linguistic cooperation, like everyday speaking and hearing. Right. Or, or yeah. Wait, did I say linguistic operation? Linguistic coordination. I should. Mm -hmm. uh, or no, no, no. Linguistic cooperation. Linguistic cooperation. Yeah, that's the phrase I applied. Um, yeah. Okay. Now counterfactuals. Okay. Well, I mean, I'm actually really dubious. I'll just say it. this class of senses, it seems to me an extreme. I'm not sure whether any of these sentences are true, this, the counterfactual senses. But we do have sentences of this kind, which are like, mm -hmm. If there were a corporation who produced robots, then, or if there were a corporation who produced, well, let me actually, let me actually use one that, um, let me use one that could be more confident. Yeah. I could say, if Ben weren't in Cambridge, I might not, I would not be recording the second, I would not be recording another episode of Destruction. Right? Okay. It's probably right. Um, now, 
One, here's one idea I have about fiction, which is that, well, you can think of, so this idea in logic of, or of an antecedent and then a consequent. So the part that goes, if it were so, what comes after the if would be the antecedent. And if it were so, and then what follows the then. So I might say, Isaac Asimov is saying, if positronic brain exists, then there are so on and so on operations that needs that is required to manufacture the positronic brain. Um so I actually don't think that that's exactly what I'm saying, but there's it's something close to that, I think, yeah. what's going on. Now I think that what I don't think that um Asimov's so Asimov sometimes might want you might actually be trying to get across such a thing. What I think Asimov's actually doing is only doing half of a counterfact for lack of work. Where he's asking you to just it's like suppose I, I don't know this novel very well. Um, okay, you can you can come up with one of your own. Okay, but he, I think he's asking you to like. Let me see if I can just find something. Yeah. Good example. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, 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 yeah. I think like um, so in like Jane Austen, you mm. were reading Pride and Prejudice at some point, right? I was. Yeah. So I think that at some point they're going. Suppose that there were a character called Elizabeth, or, supp or not suppose. Suppose that there was someone called Elizabeth, and she got into this relationship with Darcy, something like this. Now, and he has a so on and so on property. Yeah, 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 good, good, good. Um, now, I don't, I'm not sure that Jane Austen's going, if some, if there existed someone called Elizabeth with so and so properties, then ellipses. I do think she's asking you to suppose, though, that there existed someone called Elizabeth and ha who had so-and-so properties. Now, actually what I really think is going on is that she's asking you to suppose that a narrator is saying that there's someone called Elizabeth who has so-and-so properties. Now, um, the Jane, is, Jane Austen is not supposing. Well Jane, Austen, well, Jane Austen is intending you to suppose that a narrator is saying something with, her, with the words that Jane Austen has written. Okay. Now, um, I think that basically what's going one or one idea I've had is this: that as you begin, do you have Pride and Prejudice here or no? You begin, you begin Pride and Prejudice with uh, you begin Pride and Prejudice by supposing that the narrator said so and so, and then. Or so, if the narrator said so and so, it's like we have the first half of the counterfactual. And then the first half of that counterfactual, the antecedent, gets more and more elaborate as you go on. And I think that's something that I think that's something that the reader does is work out, as it were, the second half of the counterfactual as it goes on. It's like, if this happened, then so and so would happen. They begin to form, as it were, predictions of what also is going to happen in the novel. They paint they have a larger and larger picture of what's a larger and larger picture um, that exceeds just what the narrator says. For instance, like you might infer that someone is a you might infer that someone has a certain gender. You might, um, here we already have inference. Uh, you might infer that uh, 
yeah, you might infer that someone is a child, even if, even if the narrator never went, and this person is a child, or something like that. So I'm actually not sure that that work belongs to the filling out of a counterfactual. I'm not sure. I'm, I'm not sure, but there is definitely some filling out. I, I, I'm not sure. This is just one idea I've had. This is one idea I've had. Actually, I'm really not sure that it's the filling out of a counterfactual, as though um, so the reasoning might be similar. The reasoning in working, the reasoning in, in saying a counterfactual might be similar in the reasoning that where you're inferring things about the world of the novel. I'm not sure. These are just like as you can tell. These are as we when it comes to this counterfactual stuff. I'm this is a very like new idea. Not one I, I really I'm like. It's a new. It's it's a development. It's a developing idea. Right. Yeah. So as I get as like to summarize, summarize what you said so far. A fiction is when an author wants you to suppose that a narrator is saying something. Yeah, yep. And with the words that they've written. While lying people or mad people are directly supposing that themselves. Or, I don't know about supposing, I want to say. They're just saying it. They're saying things. They are saying that themselves. Yeah. Yep. If okay. if they are mad, then they might believe it themselves. But if yep. they are lying, then they they're not. They don't. Mm -hmm. Okay. Interestingly, Ben points this out actually recently in a call that we have. In many cases, the authors don't believe what they what they write. They don't. Yeah. yeah. Really, they don't. Yeah. Um, yeah. A difference is that so the madman really believes what he says, and wants you to believe it too because he thinks yeah. it's the truth. Yes. The liar does not believe a word they say, but they do want you to believe it. Yes, and yes. Um, the author doesn't believe a word they say either. Or at least most of the words they don't believe, but they also don't think you're going to believe the words either. They, so yeah. they're, in some senses, c closer to the madman than the liar, and that they want you to be on the same wavelength about the nature of the words, like the kind of right. status of them. Yeah, that's a good way to put it. Yeah, that's that actually is that's a, yeah that is good. There's not like deception involved. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, now, if I understand, I, well, maybe there's two different counterfactual notions going on here. <laughs> One of which is that you say the author wants the reader to suppose the words are being said by a narrator. Yes. <laughs> um, but the other is that the author also wants the reader to suppose the words which are being said by the narrator. Right? So, simultaneously, there's... Suppose the following the following collection of sentences yeah. are being told to you by a narrator <laughs> who believes in their truth. Mm -hmm. Right? Sometimes they don't. Like Sometimes sometimes the narrator may not believe in yeah, their truth. Yeah, they can I be guess. sarcastic, they yeah. can be lying. But who, mm -hmm. a narrator who mm -hmm. maybe means their words at face value. Yes, yes, yes. good. Right? Good. Yeah. Um, but on the other hand, the author is also asking you to suppose there exist so and so characters, right? So and so places, and such and such mm. events happen, right? Um, mm. So the first thing which which maybe bothers me a little bit here is that it, there's this kind of double layered. Yes, yes. It seems be. like it. It seems like the author wants you to suppose certain words, but the narrator is the one actually telling you. To suppose these things, right? Okay. Now, there's maybe not too much tension here, but it. I actually. Okay. Are you? No. Go ahead. Um. I'm sorry. Now I'm more confident the authors suppose. Well, maybe. I think I'm more confident the authors of what intends you to suppose, and really this word suppose, that um, that. These words are being that are produced by someone with certain attitudes. Okay, but then I think that we can actually distinguish a second layer rather easily mm -hmm. by just saying, "Does the author want you to suppose that these words, as uttered with these attitudes, are true?" Right, and those would be like the people and places and things. Um, it's like if I say, "Elizabeth grew up." in uh, Great Britain, you know, 
I think that the author, or no, if Jane Austen writes this, I think the author definitely wants to post what the narrator is saying. Right. Elizabeth grew up in Great Britain. Right. Now, there is a question, though. Does the author want you to suppose that those words are true? Now, I think to engage with even crazy people, I'm not sure. I've been thinking about this a lot. So I'm more confident in like, the minimal condition of supposing that the narrator says it. Now, you could imagine, there could be authors who also would suppose you to intend that they're true. I think to actually engage with a novel, you at least have to consider, you at least have to like consider their being true at some point. And this might be the same as engaging with a madman, by the way. To like actually yeah. understand them, you yeah. might have to... You might have to consider how they might be right. Um, I, I'm, I, I'm not oh, sure, but yeah, well, yeah, cool. Okay, yeah, I have a way to reconcile these. Yeah. So the other, I yeah, I actually I would like to ask a question first. Okay. Like, what 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 do you have in mind when you say narrator? Well, I mean, just well, first of all, it's worth noting that I think in general. For each sentence or for each chapter even, the author wants you to suppose that there's one and only one individual who's producing... Producing? Maybe... Pro well, I've gotten into questions about this, but this is the general picture. Producing words of this type. So they might not be producing the words that the author is writing, but words of the same type. Uh, so if the author writes down Elizabeth was born in Great Britain you're imagining that a narrator uses the words Elizabeth was born in Great Britain um, and with certain attitudes now I think that for each sense they're imagining you, they're asking you the author's asking you to imagine that someone is producing such a sentence and only one person is producing such a sentence or, so, or no there is a sentence such that one and only one person produced it with so and so attitudes um, something like this such that one and only one person produced it, and it was produced with certain edges, and I want to um, put the exclusivity also on, uh, or the uniqueness also on the attitudes, perhaps. Uh, and, yeah, yeah. Some some texts, though, have different narrators, like um, mm -hmm. Milan Kundera's The Joke. And I think that there, the author's asking you to imagine that for different chapters, Different individuals are producing mm -hmm. a, a, like a token, as it were. I'm not quite familiar with that. So I mean, so you can imagine. Yeah, well, I mean, I can just tell you, like, um, it's like the book has multiple perspectives, as it were. Um, so there's not just one narrator; there are actual multiple narrators throughout the book. Mm -hmm. There's a distinction as well. Some books, the narrator is an unnamed, often omniscient person. Not the real Yep. Yeah. And can comment on it. In other books, the narrator is a named character who actively participates in the story. Yep. While also documenting their perspective on it. Yep. Right. Yep. Right. Yep. Right, I think I, I kind of see that. Now. Yeah. Yes. In this, in the case of Milan Kundera, I assume I haven't read this book. I assume you mean that the narrator is a character, and the character is narrator changes. Oh, that's one way of putting it. That's one way of putting it. But I mean, is it, is the narrator a main character who participates in the action? Yes. Yes, they are. Okay. In in each case, actually. Mm -hmm. Every single narrator is. I mean, I, this is also interesting. I guess there's one way of putting it on saying that the narrator, it's, there's like, the narrator is kind of like a seat that different people occupy at different times. Or you can just say there are multiple narrators. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Okay. But I, I mean, I, I think, I was thinking about this with also um, words like I. It, it, it seems though that. Uh, There's always kind of one narrator at a time, <laughs> as it were. Uh, and one speaker at a time. There, you don't. I don't think you're being asked to imagine that the same sense is being produced by multiple individuals. <laughs> um, yeah, at least I don't think that's generally the case at all. I don't, and that's definitely not the standard model of interpretation in everyday communication. Right. No chance. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. But this. Uh, so, I do think you're right that there's a distinction here between 
Well, I'm putting it this way. Supposing that someone is saying something and supposing that what they're saying is true. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, I do think, what I am really interested in is do authors, something I'm really interested in is do authors actually want you to suppose that what they want you, do authors want you to suppose that the things you're being asked to suppose are being said are true? I'm not sure. I think at some point you have to at least entertain these things in your head as being true if you want to understand the narrator as it were. And the same, and you might have to do the same with the madman. What, what do you mean by that? And why do you say so? It's that? like a madman's talking. No, no, no. Okay, go if on. A madman's talking to you to understand him. You might have to like see where he's coming from. So you might have to. Yeah, but we are not supposed. I think seeing where you're coming from and supposing the things are true. They are they different. Compre- yeah, mm-hmm. but they different. both involve. I think that they both involve. Something like considering, considering if it were true, something like that. Um, like trying to figure out, trying to figure out how things must seem to someone who believes them. Uh, and there is a similar element here of like imagining something to be true, I think, or something like that. I'm not sure. But it seems like when you want to understand um, a certain a certain author who's saying a whole bunch of false things, many thing, times what you or I shouldn't say author in this case, I could be misleading, but a certain writer who's saying many things you believe to be false, you um, you don't, though you don't believe these things, you might try to imagine that they're true for a moment to see where they're coming from. I think that that process is involved whether or not the author wants you to, or something like that is involved, whether or not the author intends you to suppose that what they're asking you to suppose is being said is true. Um, yeah. I, I, yeah. So, there's, yeah. There's definitely a, a subtlety in, in truth values here because the author generally doesn't, doesn't want you to believe that certainly wants you to believe that the narrator believes their words are true or or believe or that the narrator intends their words on face value let's say yeah right um yeah for the most part and to the extent that the narrator may i don't know how often this comes up as a device but even if the narrator is deceiving the reader yeah the narrator is deceiving the reader on face value yeah we shouldn't imagine that the narrator will say something which is a deliberate falsehood Unless it's going to be actually revealed that that's a falsehood oh. at some point, in explicitly by the narrator, um, there might be cases of deception. So there are cases where you have an unreliable narrator. Yeah. Where a narrator will. Oh, okay. So there are. There could there be. Are, there are actually perhaps cases of, of of a of a of a narrator deliberately trying to deceive the reader. Usually when this happens, the narrator is actually a character. Yes, yes, right? yes. They're involved in the story. Yes. If you have a narrator who is a character involved in the story, then as a device to to to, to actually further convince you, maybe, that this is a character trying to tell you a story. Yes, yeah. The, this, the, the character's words may be deliberately deceptive. The character might, as it were, try to lie to you or mislead you about events. Right, right. This only works, of course, in, insofar as the reader has a clue that there is a deception. Yeah. There needs to yep. be some kind of hint that that something is that something isn't right. Otherwise, otherwise the device falls completely flat. Well, I mean, yeah. Did I interrupt you? Uh, no. It's a natural stopping point. You can say what you'd like. Well, yeah. I've been reading a book by. Uh, I've been reading a book. I've been reading books by Thomas Bernard where there are these, like, torrential first-person monologues. Torrentials are, I think, that's not my word. I think it's been applied to him. But uh, there are these long first. There are these long things from the first person, no paragraphs actually. And uh, well, I might be wrong. All right, maybe I should qualify that or something like that. But um, and you can sometimes see that. You know, the author might not really believe what he's saying. Maybe he's trying to convince himself of certain things. Or maybe he's trying to, like, tell himself a story that he doesn't really believe. As people sometimes might do in their own heads. Mm-hmm. Um, now, 
One thing I can imagine is that the the actual, or I said narrator, I should say narrator, not author, narrator. Now, I, one thing I can imagine is that the author doesn't even, as it were, know whether the narrator really believes what they're saying. But they definitely want you to imagine that they're saying these things, the narrator. Well, the, no, the author, presumably, as the creator of the, of the entire work, has a sense of whether, well, okay. They maybe. might not. They might not. No, they well, might. to the extent they might not, it would be... I, I think that the author generally in, at least intends the narrator to have a certain degree of belief in each sentence. I think generally that's true. Yep. Yeah. Um, so in what case is that not true? Where someone might be trying to... Where someone might be trying... Well, this is a really... A really interesting case, which I actually think comes up in first-person narration a lot, is trying to convince yourself of something that you don't believe, which sometimes does happen in people's heads mm -hmm. and in yeah. and in narration. Yes. You mean the narrator? Yeah, the, the narrator. The narrator the is trying. The narrator is the narrator is trying to convince themselves of something they don't believe. Mm -hmm. um, yes, I think. But even in this case, the author still knows that the narrator that this is what the narrator is doing. I think the only reason I was hedging on saying the author knows what the narrator believes or doesn't believe is that we haven't really established what it means for the narrator to believe something <laughs> because we don't actually know who or what the narrator is in general. In some stories, we might have a better sense. Yeah. Um, but again, I think importantly... Well, maybe not every not every sentence in a work of literature is meant to be taken exactly at face value. We 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 don't assume that the author we don't we don't assume that there are going to be lies in the book <laughs> yeah, that, with no clues that there's a lie, right? That if there's we, a sentence that, yeah. if there's a sentence in a book that says like Robert <laughs> stood up to speak, <laughs> we shouldn't it shouldn't be the case that Actually, he didn't get up. He was sitting down the whole time. It would yeah. be ridiculous to say this unless you could point to somewhere else where it was like, oh, well, that was that yeah. was a lie or that was a metaphor or something. Yeah, 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 um, yeah, yeah. I, I would agree. We have no, we have no understanding of what. Well, truth, there's something to this. Yeah, there's something. What, 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 whatever truth or the analog of truth means <laughs> in this fictional world, we can only get at it by the words on in the book. Yeah. So yes. there shouldn't be any words in the book which are. There shouldn't be any words in the book which are false without being intended as yes without yes. being intended from the heart right. of the narrator as being false, right? And also with okay, and also you need to know as the reader, the reader needs to have a way of determining the falsehood of that sentence. Otherwise, it doesn't make sense for it to be false, right? Um, right. There's a there's. And I'm not exactly sure what to do with this. It seems that the narrator, the narrator of a work, or the narrator of a book, has a belief in at least many of the sentences they say. In many, yeah. Right. Many. They believe many of these sentences to be true. Yeah. Um, certainly, they assert things to be true and believe them to be true. Uh, and these sentences are not, don't seem to be true. They seem to be. In some cases, completely absurd. Um, now, the same is true of the madman. Yes. But I don't think we're meant to believe that the narrator. Yes, this is extremely interesting. True. Yeah, I know. Even yeah. though the narrator believes sentences to be true, which are false. Well, I don't. One way of putting it, though, in my view, mm -hmm. that I, I mean, I agree with this actually. Yeah. I, I mean. Yeah, yeah, I, I agree. With this. I mean, one way to put it, though, is that actually these sentences aren't false. They're like, not, these, there, there are no such meaningful I, sentences. No, I, I don't necessarily disagree that I don't want to call them false because I want to distinguish them. So I know. Like, it's like, there's if yeah. uttered, then they would be false. Exactly. Something like I, that. I knew yeah. you were going to say this. If yeah. the author <laughs> said these, they would be false. If yeah. the narrator says them, they're not <laughs> quite false. Well, if the, the narrator is already like a sub, in a something we're being we're, we're supposing exists like, um, and so there's already an element of like there's a, there's already a layer of imagination as soon as you get to the narrator 
-hmm. Or with the narrator, you're already in an imaginary world, as it were. Yep. Um, yeah. So what I had a thought, I guess the reason I went to this topic, is in your original presentation of this counterfactual view, it seems like both the narrator and the fiction itself, the the... Mm. The the facts of the fiction exist in the in the antecedent, right? In the <laughs> yeah. suppose this were so. Yeah. But I, I actually think that the story as it unfolds is in the what would be the, the consequent. Very cool. Right. Very that cool. The, the thing that you're supposing is perhaps the existence of the of the of the narrator, mm -hmm. the existence of of certain characters and locations, mm -hmm. um, and certain things about the the truth of the narrator's statements. Yeah, okay. Right? Supposing maybe that the narrator is a human or some 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 entity that can a person. Let's say a person, <laughs> sure. A person that can can think, can observe, can convey ideas. Right. Perhaps with an agenda and right. certain goals. Um and that they are and that they mean for us to take every word they say in a particular way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, the consequent is so it's almost like we are, we begin by setting the scene with our little figurines of characters and the, the set wow. and all of this. Wow. And that's all the, the supposing is just in setting that up. Yeah. And then the antecedent, or not the antecedent, the consequent is. If everything the narrator says is to be taken uh, as to be said in a certain, is to be said with certain attitudes, <laughs> not necessarily as being true. Yeah, yeah. But if it's a lie, then the narrator is lying. If it's a if it's a twisting of the facts, then it's a twisting of the facts. Yeah. Here's how the here's how things would play out. Um. Certainly, you can't have the entire story happening in the antecedent. Well, I mean, you could have the entire story happen in the antecedent. Well, but I many stories seem to be seem to have a counterfactual. Some some stories actually purport to be showing you the consequent of a counterfactual. That's that's really right? good. That's really and good. They're definitely fiction, right? Yeah, um, I think 1984 might be an example. It might, I have not read it, but it might be an example. Yeah. Or the dystopian, man, dystopian novels. I was going to yeah. say even more so, like the Man in the High Castle. Mm. Seems to be a very explicit. Yeah. Suppose yep. the Nazis had won World War Two. This is what the world might look like. Right. Um. And in this case, the story is definitely happening. In the in the consequent, on the consequent side, there might be other things we need to suppose for the story to make sense because there will be characters in the story. There will be maybe unfamiliar locations or edifices. That need to be described but certainly some of the story needs to happen on the other side of the well on the other side of the counterfactual okay now we might want to say what we're I, I you know this sort of counterfactual like the logical form of the counterfactual as it were might be in many places when it comes to fiction mm -hmm. so i think that something that certain authors of dystopian novels might be trying to get across is is a counterfactual if so and so then such and such. Mm -hmm. Or, it's so like, if the Nazis had won, then it would be so. Now, I guess what I've been using counterfactuals, though, has not, has, what I've been using counterfactuals with has not just been to, hmm,
Yeah. I guess I've been I've been using counterfactual, not considering the a full counterfactual, I guess, like meaning. So so something that means if it if it were so, then it would be thus. Um, but or and, and not not such a meaning on the part of the author or narrator. But um I've kind of just been considering the antis I've kind of just been considering this as uh, in one respect, at least, as a form of reasoning, as it were, uh, a form of thinking on the part of the reader, but also there might be something on the part of the author wanting you to engage in this form of thinking. Hmm. So being like, just suppose, it's like the beginning, suppose what constitutes the end scene of counterfactual, and it's as though you're working out the consequence. Now, I don't think, now, one idea here would be that Well, certainly it wouldn't. In many cases, I just don't think what's going on is that the author has set up part of a has set up part of a counterfactual, the antecedent, and then with what comes later in the story is the consequent. Because many of those, I, or or the narrator, or no, 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 the author's doing that because the author just doesn't seem to be confident in that things given like the contingencies of the story. Um, Many things that happen in a story don't seem to just like be a consequent of the con or mm -hmm. doesn't it doesn't seem like if you put like the first there are many stories such that if you such that at a point p in the story if you were to make everything that's being said kind of the antecedent what follows I guess would be the consequent um, and, and I don't even think the narr I don't think that the author might even think that or want anyone to consider such a thing. Uh, I think that they just no. want you to, I think that, well, I think they might want you to think it like there's a causal relation, but I think they might want you to just consider like all these things as happening and then working out. But what I think is also going on though is at each, this is an interesting temporal dimension of the novel, at each point in the novel, you might be for yourself working out a counterfactual as it were. So mm -hmm. you might be supposing certain things, or you, if it were, so... And it's as though you're working out the consequences. Mm -hmm. um, that might just be a form of reasoning. It might be a form of reasoning that the author wants you to engage in. Though I'm not sure that um, the meaning of a novel is a complete counterfactual in any way. Or if there's any meaning involved in the novel that is a counterfactual. Surely, in some cases, there definitely are. And the Man in the High Castle might be one. Where the guy's just trying to get across. If things were so, they would be thus. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But I'm, I'm not sure that's part of it. But I do think something like counterfactual reasoning might always be involved. Um, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure, though, because honestly, I don't know much about counterfactual reasoning. It's, it's actually, what, what, the more, it, the one guy I've seen talk about it, this philosopher David Lewis, it's uh, pretty vague and fuzzy stuff. It's pretty vague and fuzzy territory, but that, I mean, fiction is too. Yeah, something that I've always thought was interesting in the neighborhood of fiction was this I was was inference and readers' inferences. Mm -hmm. This might be, so to speak, the working out of the counterfactual, as I put it. The working out of the consequent. That might be what's going on. Yes. I'm not sure. That's one idea. And I guess I'm reading up on counterfactual, so Mm -hmm. This has been one way to motivate my reading. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I mean, certainly I think that the reader's influence is a kind of counterfactual reasoning. Mm. It's maybe not the only kind going on. Yes, yes, Or yeah. the only yep. consequent. Um, but it definitely is a consequent. A consequence, maybe, of certain counterfactuals put forward by the author. Mm. Um, Interesting. Or suppositions. Maybe the first step of a counterfactual. Yes. Yeah. 
Um, yes, that's that's sort of well. <laughs> actually, I guess you could take it either way. Yeah, it could be just the 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 antecedent of the counterfactual set forward by the author, mm -hmm. but it could also be both sides. Like the yes, author yeah. presents. Yes. Yes. Suppose so and so. Yeah. Then it would be thus, and then from there it would be thus. Is the reader's own inferences about about the text? Yes. Yeah. Um, yeah. Or it could be. What, the, what yeah. do you mean from there? Meaning, there might we might be able to. Th so, in this sense, the the thing we we initially suppose is the existence of of the of the of the, of the world of the characters. Right. The right. spaces who are that allow for these right. imaginary people to act out right. these stories, and then the consequence, the thing that would then happen. Right. And also, we have to assume the the truth of, or the the sincerity of the narrator's words. Yes, in a sense, Sin sincerity or or or, well, we've we've litigated this already. <laughs> the, 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 yeah. the intentionality of the narrator's words. Right. Right. Well, and the, that's a good way yeah. to put it. Good. 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 So, so that's from the narrator narrator side. But mm -hmm. what about from the reader side? Well, from the reader side, that's all things we have to assume are true. The immediate consequence of that is the events of the story the the that if everything the narrator says is said with intention then you know certain characters will say certain things do certain things um and this is all what would happen if this is all what would need to be true perhaps for the narrator's for the narrator's words to be said with the intention that they are apparently said with. And assuming some condition on the narrator's the narrator's sense of truth needs to agree with the truth of the of the story, whatever that means. Yeah. In that if the narrator well, the relationship here is, is tricky and more specifically. So that's kind of the initial counterfactual, and that's a kind of complete form. We suppose certain things, and as a consequence, we get this the story playing out. Mm. Yeah. But then the reader might be able to draw things out of the story which yeah. aren't explicit in the text. Yes, um, yes, many things. Yeah. In order to understand the text, they definitely have to so perhaps like, infer we can, many things. We can perhaps infer certain things about about the psychology of characters which aren't made explicit in the text. Yes. Um, and here we might not be. We might even be assuming. And the reader also sometimes assumes certain things about the creation of the text, or, or infers certain mm -hmm. things about the author's attitudes. Yes. This seems to be a different phenomenon. Right. Than just fiction. So what is that? So that well, th there's an, there might be an element of this in the imagining on the part of the reader, mm -hmm. but this can go beyond just yeah. fiction. Yeah. It can go just. We it can, can go into the realm of interpretation broadly. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes, it seems. So this is you read a book and you pick up on a theme, but and maybe you say the author intends to comment on this theme. The author intends to comment on 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 how we interact with memories, by in, in this way. Um, and this is an inference that we draw, but we draw it n without believing that tr any kind of conditional truth of yeah. the words in the book. Yeah. We don't right. need to assume, we don't need to imagine anything happening. We just need to look at the words and understand them. And you can also do this with, even tr like even in an autobiography, yeah. where you assume every word is, is actually true. Mm -hmm. um, you might still be able to conclude from the devices the author uses, the way they describe things, that they intend to convey certain things. Um, this doesn't seem to be well, actually, in some cases it is. So, now this is tricky. Is there a difference between reading a work of fiction and trying to analyze the the psychology of a fictional character versus reading an autobiography and trying to analyze the psychology of the author who exists and who actually has done and believed all the things that they say they've done and believed? Mm -hmm. I guess it would depend on. It might depend on the author's intentions, 
what you're supposed mm-hmm. to do is suppose of the narrator, the fictional narrator. Um, if they are trying to basically, if I mean, this actually Thomas Bernard's books might be a good example here. Um, if if the author wants you to suppose that the narrator is writing this like an autobiography, then yes, it's the exact same. I, supp- I suspect. Um, except that there's a layer of imagination, as it were. That's the layer of imagination is what I was maybe trying to get at. Yeah, yeah. Can, I mean, there is a yeah. difference. And if an, the another, author actually exists, we can speak of their psychology. Yes, in yes. a fairly concrete way. Yes, it might not. Right. Be, we might not actually have much grounds for. We might not really be able to comment too much on the truth of of our conclusions. Right. Or we might really be be making educated guesses based on what we read, but it makes sense to say that. It makes sense to say that Nabokov believes or has a certain has certain feelings towards his own life, as mm-hmm. we read in speak memory. Right. We can we can we can talk in a fairly consistent and meaningful way about Nabokov's psychology. It seems that we speak either less meaningfully or meaningfully in a different quality. If we talk about Humbert, yeah. Humbert from Lolita, who yep, doesn't right. exist, we can't. He, he doesn't have a psychology because he's not a real person. Yeah. But nonetheless, we might be able to do a similar method of analysis and interpretation. Yes. To 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 try and conclude things about this character's mental processes. Um. It seems we we need to do this having already supposed the. Well, really, having already supposed that there exists such a character, of, yes, of course, who has said yeah. with intention the following yeah. set of words, and with a certain degree of truth, right? As in, or at least sincerity. Yeah. Well. Oh, I in mean, the autobiography, you're talking... Yeah, yeah. I well, guess truth, I guess truth, yes. yeah. In the, well, in the case of the autobiography, we really imagine almost everything in the autobiography is true. Um, well, it is actually true in the real world. These really? Or we definitely think it's sincere. In an autobiography, we definitely there, might be, there might be mistakes, and there might even be cases where the author actually can't bring themselves to admit something. I, I think all all the things in my autobiography is true mm-hmm. to the author, of course. Well, yeah. but I, that's no, just sincere. The author, the that's just sincerity. Yeah. Yeah. No, yeah. the author might actually. I think I think authors oh, of autobiographies are capable can, of can try to lie. of lying. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there, and there are some cases where, if you if you read Rousseau's Confessions, he says, "This is the worst thing I ever did. This is the worst sin I ever committed. So is I stole a ribbon and then I blamed this little girl." And I, I don't know. Somehow, I n- I don't necessarily believe that this is the worst thing he ever did. It's maybe the worst thing so he's willing to admit. Exact exaggeration. Yeah. Well, I don't think this is I don't exaggeration. Think, I think yeah. it's, it's possible there are details of his life. Actually, well, this is no, the same no, no, thing no. as lying. But but yeah. worse, who is there to judge what is the worst thing he ever did? I mean, it can be oh. anyone, right? You can try to yeah. judge. Oh, I'm that's not even what, that's on his. Yeah, he certainly his believes. Judgment. He certainly believes it's the worst thing. He, 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 he might. He might not so. believe. He might not believe. He might. He might want to. He might to want to. He might want you to believe that he believes it. Yes. Yes. Um. So, even in the case of an autobiography, we might be a little suspect of the truth of every sentence. But if Rousseau says, "I left, I left Geneva." And so, walked south. We should assume he actually did this, probably, or at least for at least most of the sentences. Maybe he misremembers things or deceives us. Right. In a few right. cases. Yeah, I mean, I don't know about this truth thing, I did sincerity thing in general, mm-hmm. and definitely in general the intending you to believe that the that the speaker is intending you to believe that the speaker believes what they say. Mm-hmm. That's there, but I'm not sure about this. Uh, supposing it true, to be true. Now, as I've said, though, I do think in order to understand these utterances, 
you might have to do something like taking them to be true. And as you might have to with a madman, most of whose think senses you don't believe, in order to understand him, or in order to understand his utterance, you may well have to, to see where he's coming from, I guess, see what it would be like to believe these things, as it were, which involves something like supposing or imagining to be true. Right, right. But right. I'm not sure that you, I'm not, I'm just not sure about this, like, autobiography take just straightforward truth thing. Um, I mean, madmen might write autobiographies. Generally, though, Ma you're right, you're right. Madmen exactly. might write giant autobiographies. Generally, though, I do think to engage with a madman who's written an autobiography or a narrator who's not a biography, if uttered by the author, would be false. Um, you do have to do something like imagining these were true uh, or supposing for the moment this sort of thing. Yeah. Uh, but I'm not sure that you have to take I'm not sure you have to actually like think that even in the world in which someone produces words of this sort with so-and-so attitudes, that those words are true. And I think generally you'll have to suppose that, not have to, you're, you're wanted or you're supposed to suppose that uh, these things are said sincerely. And that would just come, that would just be part of the attitudes with which they're said. But that they're true, I'm not so sure. I do think, though, that to engage with and to interpret the fiction, you will have to do something like imagine what the author is supposed to have sincerely said is true. Um, but some, now this comes up on a larger question of mine, which is, in what does interpretation and understanding consist? Now. For, for instance, when you're reading the autobiography of a madman, I'm not sure. I think that something like supposing to be true might be involved. I really don't know. This is actually a really, this is an extremely interesting, it might even be a profound question about interpretation. I don't know. Um, yeah. Yeah. I don't know, though. That is, I guess, this is actually something that's interesting. I guess my theory of fiction developed out of a theory of meaning and communication, which I guess also came with theory of truth. Perhaps something that I should consider is a theory of understanding and interpretation, which might help me here. Because I have been thinking about things really from the side of the author. Um, and obviously, like, meaning and interpretation are intimately connected, I think. Right. Uh, perhaps, oh yeah, it's like, you, you I mean, you, you want your audience to in interpret your words a certain way. And that, that might be itself, that wanting might be what determines what we might call the meaning of those words. I'm not sure. Um, But one thing that I really should consider, I think, are like the processes on the part of the interpreter, like what's going on there. This, 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 this idea of interpreting a madman's autobiography, that might turn out to be fruitful. A uh, madman's autobiography, yes. What do you mean when you try to interpret a madman's biography? Well, I mean, what's that and what's involved there? 
someone a madman. What are you What are you actually doing when you're in, interpret interpreting it? Well, I, that, I guess that's the question. Oh, what am I trying? That's actually a very interesting question. What am I trying to get out of it? Um. I guess I might be trying to see the way, it, like I might be trying to get in on a certain person's world view. That's yeah. More, which is and that also of, might be relevant to the explanation of their behavior and actions. Right, right, yeah. Which is the kind of similar to what we want to get out of reading a fiction, aren't we? Yeah, I guess so. But there's a difference in that it's not a real person's perspective, I guess. You're just catching a perspective. No, but a mad person's perspective is that so different from a fictional person's perspective? Well, the main difference is that the madman exists, um, and so <laughs> the so the madman might 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 seem to live in a world with very little resemblance to ours. They might they might actually perceive things wildly differently from us. Yeah, but they do, they do seem to exist, as or at least we really believe they exist in our world that we could go and actually meet them and shake their hand. Um, a fictional character we certainly don't believe exists in any way. Yeah, but other than the existence, <laughs> the 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 narration, for perhaps example, other than the well, the narration is equally. You know, uh, imaginary. Mm-hmm. Uh, or, or, or I, I don't know though because so it's worth noting that I don't think I think that many authors don't want you to think that their narrator is crazy, mm-hmm. right? The narrator. I think they actually might yeah. even want you to believe that. By and large, they're speaking no? truly in many cases. And this is something that Ben was saying earlier. I think by and large, they might by and large want you to think that they're speaking truly. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, it certainly seems like the narrator. To the extent that the narrator exists, they exist in a very different world from us. A okay. world in which there are not even, even though they might say things about dragons right. or robots or ray guns or anything, they do, that they are not in their own world considered crazy. Yeah, they, 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 are, they, are, they are not in their own world crazy, yeah. but they yeah. are in our world. Yeah, they but they're not if in our world. Them in our world, they would be crazy. But, but they're, they're just not, not in our, our world. world. Yeah. Um, and so we're able to take their words as being, you know, a, 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 a perhaps lucid description. Right. Did I right. use that word right? A perhaps lucid description of Ooh, another world. That's good. That isn't our own. That's Whereas good. Whereas a madman is giving us yeah. a, a very warped vision of our own world. Um, y- yeah. Yeah. In, I will say, interesting case. Wittgenstein's Mistress, one of my favorite novels. The Wait, narrator. It's a novel. It's a novel. The narrator. Um, I think the author wants you to believe, or the the that the narrator is a bit mad. This is a very interesting case. Mm-hmm. Um, where definitely, I do think that there are the intending to suppose that, or the author is intending you to suppose that words of this sort were uttered with certain attitudes, but. And telling you to suppose that they're true, I'm not sure. Mm-hmm. The uh, I mean, the author in this book actually also seems doubtful of it. Um, so this is, would be an interesting case mm-hmm. where the author might actually want you to believe that this is the autobiography of a madman. Uh, mm-hmm. Or, or suppose suppose yeah. this were. <laughs> okay, I, so I guess that's true. But <laughs> but that's not generally the case. That's not, that's not generally the case. It's not generally the case. In the case of, the, of, a, of a madman's own autobiography, they don't. They are writing it. They they believe they are writing a, a a book from the perspective of a character who sees the world as it who sees the world normally, right? Who sees yeah, who correctly. sees the world correctly. Yeah, we should say. Um, in the case of an author writing a madman, they believe that they're writing from the perspective of a character who sees their world incorrectly. Right? This is good. This um, is good. But generally, I think. That's not what authors are doing. Um, no, to no. To the extent they're doing it, that's... It's a device, maybe. Yeah. But uh, it's not the default in fiction. I will say... I'm, I, I, I will say this. I'm, 
there, something I like about this fiction topic for me is that there is actually like real diversity in mm-hmm. the subject matter. Like there's real diversity. You can make some general claims, but like there's so much, I guess. Well, I guess this is interesting. <laughs> there's as much room, there's at least as much, there's at, it's at least as diverse and rich as everyday speaking. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and that's extremely rich. Because um, there's also, within a text, you also find not just like assertion or things like that. You find sarcasm, you find asking questions. These are all things that belong to ordinary speech, as it were. But you can import all of that onto the level of the narrator. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But then maybe maybe there's even a further uh, dimension of richness that, that, I, that I'm reaching for here that I should try to get at. It's very exciting now. I'm not sure it's this way with my names topic as much where there's really like this much room for play. And it might be because this is like a broader theory. Mm-hmm. It's like a theory of meaning and communication in general. And then, and then like a theory of fiction which depends on that theory. Mm-hmm. Um, you could even argue that the theory of names is just like a bit of the theory of meaning and communication. I actually think you can isolate them pretty well from each other. Mm-hmm. Uh, for instance, to accept my theory of names, you don't need to even accept the idea that I don't think you need to accept the idea that uh, like meaning isn't conventional. You don't have to. Mm-hmm. You could say like actually, it conventionally means what Mason says it means. Right. <laughs> um, uh, which would I? Well, there are actually some upshots of this for conventionalists uh, or some benefits, advantages of this way of thinking. Mm-hmm. But uh, uh, yeah. So uh, yeah, I guess that this is also very exciting territory. It's like, yeah, there's a lot of lot of it's a very rich field <laughs> lots of room for play yeah oh. what I wanted to say earlier a bit earlier yeah I'd like to bring us back to the the thing about madman and fiction yes you said we're talking you, you, you're saying that madman is not describing the world as it is while of narrator is describing the world he is in or she is in as it is although yes, it's a yes, different yes, world yes 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 yeah, yeah. <laughs> but what about like yeah I, I know yeah I understand that but like from my perspective I believe in like a, a bit of different truth truth than <clears throat> yeah I knew like, exactly where you were going yeah as soon as you started the sentence yeah <laughs> So it's like, what what do you mean? Exactly, at, like, describing it as it is, mm-hmm. as what? Yeah, Yeah. so I guess your, 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 your doubts here would come to the very notion of true true in a given world, I guess, right? Or just truth in general. Yeah, well... Mm-hmm. Is that what you think he's getting at? I think so. Okay. Like, <laughs> I mean, no, it, it's, it's possible. Some guy comes out, he writes this book full of outrageous statements... He writes his his autobiography. Nothing seems plausible. He's talking about aliens. He's talking about uh, <laughs> like vampires. All of these fantastical concepts. He's saying crazy things, and it turns and everybody thinks he's 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 just has no grip no grip on reality. He believes everything he's written is true. Everybody else thinks it's blatantly false, but actually he's the one who's somehow seeing the world as it actually is. This is possible. Completely. And everybody else is deceived. That's that's possible. So maybe we should replace truth with and and even this I think you're gonna you're going to say Yeah, he's exactly. Gonna, he's gonna, <laughs> he's exactly gonna wow. yeah, exactly some convention of truth. Yeah. Right? Which, yeah. Right. Which okay, there's there's a level of uncertainty in any of this. We could Right. Not just for uncertainty. All we know. Like he's, this is straight to the concept of truth. Yeah, all, but, I mean, <laughs> but we can we can try and verify our concepts of truth by asking each other questions and seeing if we agree. But for all we know, we might just be using words yeah. in 
completely different ways from each other in ways that somehow every we we somehow managed to interpret each other as saying sensible things but I, I might think that we're talking about fiction if I but you guys think that what we're talking about is like what I would call I don't know like archery or something we could be talking about like we might we might be completely talking past each other in terms of the pictures we have in our heads which we might never be able to convey but some other guy who comes in and starts using and starts describing things with language that none of us would interpret as being true in whatever our models of language are we might conventionally say this guy this guy's got no idea this guy's spouting falsehoods um I think I think sincerity or maybe this idea of intention is a, is a less slippery concept than truth because I think we can be much more confident yeah but to a madman yeah. he's being oh a madman is still speaking with the intention of being true good yeah, yeah. the concept of mm -hmm. sincerity is I think yeah. is obviously mm -hmm. dependent yeah. on the concept of truth yes for what it's worth I think if a madman writes his autobiography and it seems to have no bearing on events that could plausibly happen it still wouldn't be fiction. I Good. Think. I agree. I still I think totally it's closer to a non-fiction yes. autobiography yes. that yeah. we might think is yep. absurd yes. than yes. to yes. a work of fiction. I would um, agree. I yes. would agree. Yeah. I would agree. Yeah. Um, Look at us looking at intentions. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. Good. Speak your yeah. attitudes. So what I'm trying to say here is that a narrator is very much similar to a madman in the way that both of them are very sincere in what they are saying. Mm -hmm. But yeah. what a well, madman say is still not a fiction because a fiction is not written by the narrator. A fiction is written by the mm -hmm. author Good. talking about the yeah. narrator. Good. Good. Mm -hmm. But they but you're I suppose to imagine that the narrator produced something very much like what the author produced. Yeah, like maybe. The sa yeah, yeah, the same oh, sentence of yeah. the same sort. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the narrator seems somehow subordinate to the author. Definitely, the narrator can't exist without the author <laughs> right. creating the narrator. <laughs> right. But where, whereas the madman can exist without anybody else there to there to create him or witness him. Um, right. Right. Have any, any, have anything, anything else you want to talk about? Something? Yeah, I think we, we have a really good recording. Yes, for I did. Today. I actually think this is yeah. yeah. This is brilliant. All right. This was a lot of fun. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for having me on. Yeah. yeah. Thank you for having me on. I hope that wait don't don't stop it yet. I hope that you two have um, I hope that you two have come to appreciate each other's intellectual powers, which are. I mean rather impressive very much yes, yes. yes. very okay. impressive conversation uh, i really enjoy this okay. i did as well i would say the, the same thing to you um yes right. this has been a really fun night <laughs> okay right. okay yeah. all right and thank you yeah all right yeah. great thank okay. you very much both of you for for being here yes, on thank the you show. for having us thank you thank you for having us yeah. Yeah. and thank you all the listeners who who have been <laughs> listening to the second episode of destruction thank you very much bye